Check with Richard. Richard says it. Okay, we're working with people. Test one, two. Okay, we'll start back again. Sorry for that delay. We now have sound back, so everything can be recorded and streamed live. So thank you for that last answer, Sally. Uh, sorry if we haven't got all of it. Um, so um, Stephen, then Nigel, thank you for coming to the table. We've relieved uh, Anthony to go to his uh, anniversary evening. Um, just to, to answer the last questions, um, the few questions that um, Councillor Willits asked, and then we'll Hopefully that will be the end of our, our session. You've been here a long time. Thank you. And we've got uh, a, a few more items on the agenda. So Steve and then Nigel, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corey. Uh, uh, my colleagues have had to apology, have said apologies. They've had to go back and, uh, and be with the ordinary people. Um, <laughs> and uh, Councillor Willits, you yourself as wit witness Panto, the most popular art form um, that can be anybody and everybody within that auditorium. This year was record sales, uh, and I think that speaks volumes in terms of uh, our ability to offer something right the way across the board. I think my highlighting those uh, projects for next year was really about where we're going above and beyond uh, to intervene and to work with those communities that are excluded to make sure that they do access what we do, whether it be within the building or out in Grainstead or wherever else in the borough. Um, and another example I'd give you is where we're working with uh, CBC on the Cultures to Commemorate event at the end of March, which is uh, marking two years since COVID and working with a wide range of community groups to present uh, um, an evening to bring people together, to have a, a shared sense of their bereavement, also a shared sense of their community, and to mark and to highlight everybody's contribution during COVID, whether it be uh, refuse collections, whether it be a frontline worker in a supermarket. Um, I'll go on, and I'm sure Nigel will give us more uh, specific information around the curriculum. Uh, it is a national problem where the arts and the creative uh, subjects are being excluded from the curriculum. Um, it is harder to get into schools, so therefore we are working more creatively, dare I say, with those schools to enable that kids do have the same access to those creative subjects that we have all benefited of our generation in this room. I'll give you another example where we're now a home for Essex Music Service on a Saturday to teach children and young people uh, instruments and they don't have to have the resources or the time or parental or carer effort to go all the way to Chelmsford. 
that we are now a centre for that Essex Music Service, and they're able then to uh, benefit from all of the new facilities that we have on site. Um, a shared booking system, well, as you know, we already run all of the booking systems for Charter Hall, for this space, for events in the park. Um, I would say that is a, an objective for us in the future, and we're all in discussions about how we do that, how we work together to get our collective marketing spend to work better, and how we then can have the add-on to that, be that uh, tourism, the visitor economy, etc., everything that's grown so much in COVID, um, and how can we then look at a joint and combined offer um, and looking at examples right the way across the country, um, there are fantastic moments. Um, I was down in Medway a couple of weekends ago and 60,000 people came out to see installation and the light show across the town. And that was where people are coming together. And that is ordinary folk on the streets watching and participating in work that they might not have access to. And uh, in terms of timing of agreements, they will always be out of sync, I'm afraid. Uh, the Arts Council, we thought we're going to announce a four-year funding deal. They're only just announcing a three-year deal. But I think it's about us working together to understand the nature of those agreements. It is absolutely so appreciated. Having that four-year funding agreement on the table means that we can, with confidence, go and talk to other funders. As I mentioned, we've been funded by two national trusts and foundations uh, in the last year, and they specifically uh, noted the support of you as a local authority. So it's being uh, savvy and canny about that investment being on the table in order that it can work harder for our own collective benefit. Thank you, Stephen. Nigel, please. Hi there. In case any of you don't know me, I'm Nigel Hildreth. I'm chair of the board of the Arts Centre. I've allowed Anthony to whiz off because I think I don't fancy the wrath of his wife. Here, um, I, I'd like to answer two of those questions, Councillor Willits. Um, one is about the general public and, and coming in and, and general public. I don't think there's anything as the general public, really, to start off with. They're all different people who have different interests in different things. And the Arts Centre is, is fortunate in the sense that we can operate on a week seven different items with different niches, if you like, of interest. So I went to the Arts Centre on Sunday and I saw a relaxed performance by the City of London Symphonia. Fantastic top professional classical musicians giving a classical concert specifically aimed at families and as a relaxed performance. Wonderful performance. On Friday, I shall be comparing the um, school's rock prom, where we have eight bands from local schools, secondary schools, coming along to perform on that fantastic professional stage at the Arts Centre, and they'll be giving a performance there. Now, not necessarily my own cup of tea, but I do think it's a worthwhile thing to do, and other people seemingly are buying tickets for it, so that's fine, it's good. And on Sunday again, it's a jazz performance. So, you know, I know it's not for everyone. Monday was folk, and... There's all these different things which clearly cater for different needs. And therefore, the general public is very much welcomed into the Arts Centre and does get enticed in there in different ways. Curriculum and outreach. Whoa. Um, as some of you know, I taught in Stanway School and also Headingham School and at the Sixth Form College in a total of 40 years of teaching as head of music and head of curriculum for the arts. So I've got some knowledge about this. First of all, I would say yes, those areas of the curriculum like music, drama, art, dance, are all under threat within the school. The curriculum has been under threat, particularly even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has, in my opinion, crystallized that. 
It's embattled the whole of the curriculum because there's no doubt you can't operate things. Things like school productions, for example, which involve all these various art forms. You can't operate those if you've got to operate a bubble of one year group. So you can't do that. And that a lot of things like ensembles and activities have suffered. There's no doubt about that. And that's going to be a very long-term movement of addressing that, to, to bring it back up to the level it was even before the pandemic. I actually, from experience as a teacher, I would say it's going to take five years to do that. And in the meantime, if we're getting outreach from the Mercury, from First Sight, from the Art Centre in all sorts of different projects which are involving youngsters, that only enhances what could go on. It doesn't replace what's needed in the curriculum in any sense. It's not a plot to sort of remove what's in the curriculum. It can't be. In my time as music, head of music, I worked with all of the London orchestras in various education projects. I've worked with all sorts of composers and, and people like Julian, uh, Gillian Weir and uh, people like that and Elizabeth McConaughey in the way back when. And these people are fantastic at working in the classroom and they enhance what you do. But you can only do that if the curriculum is strong as well. Because you've got to build on that. It's no good someone coming in and doing a workshop and then saying, right, goodbye, that's it. It doesn't happen. It's got to be built on. It's got to be developed. And that's where you need the good teachers to be able to do that and carry on. I'm sure my colleagues would agree with that. So therefore, we're not replacing the curriculum. We're giving it a life belt at the moment. And I think that life belt is being clung to. And hopefully we'll get things. If any of you are free on Friday the 18th, six local schools are all performing as part of the school's prom concert that I organize each year. And that's in Charter Hall. <coughs> now, normally I've got 10 schools doing that, but only six felt they could put groups forward this year. That shows you how much it's been the effect of the pandemic has had. And anything that helps them to go through in the next five years will be gratefully received. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thanks for your experience adding into that as well. So I think that's, that's given quite a comprehensive answer. Dennis is nodding. That's good. Thank you uh, to the three of you. Thank you, Nigel, for stepping in to Anthony's shoes there. Um, I don't see any other indications from councillors. I think we have covered a whole uh, wide spectrum of questions uh, this evening and we've asked and I think quite frankly you you all covered in your presentations very early on the value for money we get out of you and that investment is absolutely clear so we've asked a bit more than just that in the end uh, as we often do but thank you so much all three of you for coming and uh, for giving us such a, an in-depth uh, run through of your organizations hope to see you all at them soon when us ordinary folk and everyone else, go along and enjoy the offers that you give to Colchester and the people in our town. Thank you. And uh, you're free to go and to warm up. Good night. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, what is our resolution then in regard to um, this, this unit of scrutiny? Yep, I'll get to that. Oh, yep. We have to, um, we've reviewed quite significantly the range of activity and the programming delivered by the organizations and we've reviewed uh, I believe the financial uh, agreements that we have the grant funding that is provided I do feel in the presentations they covered some of the financial aspects that we were asking them for <clears throat> um, and to be honest that that covers for me uh, the review angle of our uh, recommendations and uh, decisions that we have tonight. The only point that uh, Councillor Barton did say to be put on record the thanks, and I do think we should note the contributions of our organisations, not just to the economy, but to the social fabric of our, um, our borough, and especially during COVID as well. So I think that could be noted, Owen, if that's okay. But are we satisfied that we've reviewed? I think we have. And there's no clear recommendations that we have to take this evening. I think we should be noting, Chairman, that the, the move to four-year funding model 
uh, was welcomed by all the organizations because that was a, a sort of innovation which has uh, come in over the last couple of years uh, and was well received. And I, I, I think we should acknowledge that in, uh, in our report of the scrutiny. Yeah, happy to add that in as well. Okay, therefore, thank you again. Good night. Um, and we can move on to item 11. And we can welcome uh, Councillor Ellis. Thank you for waiting, Andrew. I know you're suffering a bit from a cold. Sitting here in the cold probably hasn't helped. So we'll forgive any coughing and spluttering and uh, we'll be gentle with you. So over to you, Andrew. You do have a five minute window in which to tease us with what you've been up to and we can then jump into more detail through questions. Over to you. Five Five minutes isn't very long, um, Chairman, but we'll see how I get on. I've, I've made a load of notes because, as you know, I've got quite a large portfolio. Um, firstly, um, thank you very much indeed for having me along um, to share my portfolio with you. Uh, as you know, I picked it up during um, well, the end of um, sort of the, or the beginning of the post-pandemic recovery phase, I guess you could call it. Um, and that certainly had quite an impact on my portfolio. And I'll touch on some of that as we go through. Um, in my first or my nine months or so as your portfolio holder for this one. Um, I, I can't say I've become an expert in housing and planning. Um, uh, I, I've, I've done my best. Um, what I can say is I've learned that Colchester has a brilliant team of officers um, in both of those departments, um, as well as within our Elmo Colchester Borough Homes. Um, uh, do I remember every fact that they presented to me? No, I don't. Um, but I know they're always there at the end of the telephone. Um, you'll know that, uh, Councillor Lily, you've done this um, to help if needed. Um, and if there are any questions you ask this evening that I can't answer, um, then I will make sure that I get you one um, with their assistance. Uh, with that in mind, I'll just trot through um, a, few, a few things that have been going on within the portfolio. Uh, one, the HRA business plan. I don't think that came to scrutiny, but that went through um, Cabinet. That's been updated. Um, it's a huge piece of work. It was started well before I became the portfolio holder. Um, we've had £283 million pounds of um, improvement works planned over the next 30-year period. Um, although we're still currently short of um, being able to meet our net zero target, um, Chairman. I know you're um, very keen on net zero, um, as are we all, um, but we just do not have the funds to be able to do that at the moment. Um, so we are taking a fabric first approach, which is insulation, um, new boilers, um, what have you. Uh, technology, as officers always say to me, is continually improving, it's becoming cheaper. And actually we'll review this in five years time and I think we'll find that we, we can probably get there. Um, we just can't get there with, with um, the situation that we're in at the moment. Uh, fees and charges, again, um, we've, we've um, reviewed those and changed those this year. It's, it works on CPI plus one, as you guys know. Um, actually, if we could keep that, and I've talked to, you'll, you've got Jeff Beals on later. Um, I, I've talked to him about it. If we could keep CPI plus one, we could actually meet our net zero probably because we'd have sufficient funds to be able to do that. Um, and maybe that's a conversation we need to have with government. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we had was having CPI minus one, um, which obviously um, caused somewhat of a dent, but we are where we are. Um, another project that was well underway when I became the portfolio holder was the 100 Homes project. Um, again, um, actually incredibly successful. I think one of the one of the drivers behind it, people thought, was it would help stimulate the housing market in Colchester. Um, as well as providing affordable housing for our residents. Um, and when you read the cabinet report, it said it would stimulate the housing market. In fact, I think we've been chasing the housing market to a, st to a certain extent with it. Um, however, we have continued with it. It's something I reviewed very early on. Um, we made the decision to continue. Uh, currently, um, 76 homes have been uh, acquired. A further 20 are in the legal process and four are under offer. So that will complete the that would complete the 100. Only issue with it, and it is, I'll, I'll, I'll be up front with it at the minute, is that um, only 16 or 17 have been let so far. And that's purely down to the challenges that we face. You're going to be looking at KPI targets later, I think. Um, it, it's purely down to the, the conditions in the market, materials, labour, 
um, contractors and what have you, but and, and an awful lot of work to do in those properties to bring them up to standard, and certainly EPCC, um, a lot of them actually to be um, to be able to put people into those homes. Um, that said, um, you know, despite those challenges, uh, again with affordable housing, uh, 82 affordable houses uh, have been or homes have been delivered uh, so far. Uh, this year with a further 62 forecast in the last quarter. Um, that brings us to 144 for the year. That's uh, another positive uh, in, in a lot of very difficult circumstances. Uh, and that includes six by Amphora um, in Crefield Road and Hardy's Close. Uh, the town deal, um, which you're all well aware of, um, is going to see a tremendous investment into Grinstead uh, with the heart of Grinstead uh, project. Um, 151 officers reviewed and passed the business case. I think you've been through the business case yourself. I'm going to be going through that pre-cabinet um, in the next week. Um, through the hard work of Ruth Newcomb, I'm going to name check her on this one because Homes England have invested £1.7 million into Colchester um, in, the last, in the last year, continuing to support our affordable housing delivery. Uh, in planning, we've seen a 27% increase in applications and 2,711 against 2,139 last year. Tragically, um, as you all know, we lost Alistair Day um, in the autumn. Um, he, was our he was a specialist team manager, um, much loved and a huge amount of knowledge um, we lost when we lost Alistair. Um, the development management team structure has been changed as a result of that, actually. It's probably stimulated um, that change. Um, we have, um, it, it's been reviewed to respond both to twin challenges of staff retention in a highly competitive market. We've got the same issue in building control. You may, we can talk about that later. Um, and, um, and also a major uplift in the workload, as I've said, 27% up is, is large. Um, and again, I'm quite happy to expand on that later if you'd like to. Um, Lots has been delayed due to the um, local plan delay, uh, but post-adoption we'll begin work on uh, new SPDs. Um, you'll be pleased, Chairman, because one of them is sustainability and climate change uh, and also biodiversity net gain, both of which are dear to, um, I think, a lot of people's hearts here. Um, also, my infrastructure, as I'd rather call it, um, development constraint audit can finally get underway. It's probably the starting gun to the next plan review, actually, but rather than pulling the trigger and saying we're going to be reviewing the local plan, it's the first piece of evidence we need to start gathering before a plan is eventually reviewed. And, and, and if we do it post-adoption, it means we could still use it as valid evidence when we undertake the next plan. Um, nearly £6 million has been agreed through S106 uh, obligations um, and a further 160 um, affordable homes. Uh, have been secured through the S106 agreements as well, finalised this year, um, which is incredibly uh, positive. Um, coming up, we've got, uh, as I said, um, some SPDs, uh, the Development Constraint Audit. Um, Colchester um, will um, be developing our own design code. Um, one of the issues, I think, actually, that the arts of the conversation that you've just had with which was, I found rather uplifting actually. Art, art has the ability to inspire us, and I think buildings do too. And they also have the, the ability to depress. Um, and as you travel around Colchester, I think you find more and more, whether it's, a, um, it's due to the Essex Design Guide, which seems to have been adopted now throughout the country, um, or just the fact that we have so many volume house builders. We are, it's all homogenous buildings. You, you don't know, you could be anywhere, um, and it's really, really disappointing. Having our own design codes will give us the ability to change that. It will be Colchester's code. It will mean that, that builders will have to develop according to Colchester's codes, and it won't just be one code. It'll be a number of codes which actually for different parts of the borough and different areas, which means that they will, you know, we'll be able to pull on, pull in on their own identity. And that's something that will not only involve members, but it will also involve um, the communities. And as you know, I'm, I've always been very keen to have community and community group involvement. Uh, master planning in the town centre. 
It's another thing that um, we want to do is building on the local plan and the strategic plan and the town deal. Um, taking a holistic approach to, um, to the town centre and working with Essex County Council, stakeholders, and again, communities uh, to ensure that Colchester not only survives, uh, but positively thrives. Uh, again, feel free um, to ask me about that later if we want to expand. Um, and finally, um, I think it's already been said this evening uh, by Anthony actually, but portfolio holders come and go. Um, and our staff in the in in the main uh, remain constant. And I think I've just got to say a big thank you, whilst I can publicly say it to them, um, a thank you to officers for the support and help that they've given me this year. May they continue to do so. May I continue to do this as well? And and last name check, I'm going to name check Bethany Jones, who is one of our planners, um, and she won the Young Planner of the Year award. And I think members again should be aware that actually we've got some we've got some incredibly special staff within our organization um, i'm happy to take any questions um chairman thank you andrew that was a, a good run through um uh, let you go over time because you're saying some good things there so that's absolutely fine and um the the last points you make about the staff and and uh, Beth Jones in particular, that's very good to hear. So thank you for, for sharing those comments. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll go around to others first. I see Mike indicating first. Councillor Lilly, over to you, and then Councillor Whitehead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. And um, thank you, Andrew, for coming along. It, it, it's, um, you've taken on an awful lot. I only had uh, the planning side of the committee and enforcement, and that was enough. Uh, to, to keep you going for all that time. Uh, but um, as you said, the officers that we have, they are pretty impressive. And uh, I learned an awful lot from them. And the ideas that you come forward, they, they, they always come up with something. They didn't dismiss it all the time, did they? They would just look at it and, uh, and then come up with something. But it's, it's, you've taken on an awful lot. Um, it's interesting you said about the, um, uh, the town master plan. Because I think that the way that things are changing in planning, especially with um, permitted development, are big bugbear, as you know, and, and, and thanks for your help in, in organising the training for that for everybody. It was good. Um, we do, I think we do, you're right, we do need a master plan just for the town centre to protect ourselves from um, unwanted development, but... Permitted development can be wanted as well, can be needed, and it can be good in, in certain ways. It's better to have no empty shops laying empty for years, and we can make use of them to other things, and, and having people in them uh, and living in the town centre would, would help everybody. Um, but you know, the, the bigger applications are ones we need to keep hold of, uh, I believe. Debenhams might be one that comes up in the future. Um, It'd be interesting to see what happens with in other areas of the parts of the town, uh, the the country. They have taken over. There's some have been converted to gaming centres, uh, like the Trocadero in, in in London. One I think was in Birmingham. But um, it, it's very good. I, I agree with the master plan that we should have and talk to everybody, and then we could start somewhere. If a, a load of applications come in for student accommodation, say. Uh, um, we could actually look towards the master plan and say we will be nobody's asked for that, so we can um, have a good reason not to press forward with that. And I'll be quite supportive about that as well. Um, the other one I want to ask you really about is is the the way that the planning is going and changing. And as you know, you can go to a meeting and they will say, "Oh, there's a new planning law coming out this week and that week, and, and something will go on." But um, is there a future for planning committees, do you think, anymore? Most of the decisions made are, are by officers. 90%, I believe, of decisions made are, are made by officers, and they are the professionals, after all, and they, they, they do a really good job in, in Colchester. And the ones that are contentious just come forward to the committees. But we end up falling foul of, of everything, really, all the laws and the regulations that we have. Do you think there's a time where all planning decisions will be made by officers, planning officers, the professionals, and there'll be no need for a committee anymore? 
I, I get frustrated. I'm sitting on the Brown Committee, and I get frustrated as long with everybody else. I and mean, then is on there. We've all served on there at one stage, and most of the time we we dislike a lot of the plan applications, uh, as you know, because of the traffic congestion. We have no backup really, you know, from from highways as such. They don't object to a lot. Um, but yeah, and we pass it, so we all get frustrated if we refuse. It goes to appeal. But I just wondered, have you heard anything on the grapevine, or or will there be a time where committees are are not needed in that respect? So I'll leave it there. And you're doing a. It was great to see you take it on the, the hundred. It was Adam, I think. It was his idea uh, when he was in C CBH, I think it was Adam Fox. Start that off, I think, a couple of years ago, didn't he? The 100 homes. So it was good of him. Uh, you doing his good your work along that lines. And um, I'll end it there. So uh, that's enough. So thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Mike, yeah, I, th I think 100 homes was something that Tina Hinson, again, one of our uh, fantastic officers, came up with. Um, and she was looking at it from the point of view of us using our general fund doing it and actually building, uh, building social housing. Um, that it wouldn't have been a subject to right to buy, but I think that it, it, we then we then went down the, the, the route of using the HRA, um, which was a decision that was taken and, and probably sensible. I think it was taken really because COVID hit and we were in a very different place to where we were even two or three months pre-pandemic, weren't we? Um, and that's why that decision was taken and, um, and we've been doing it through the HRA. Um, the... Um, I'm delighted you're pleased with master planning the town centre. I think it's really important. I, I agree with you regarding permitted development. Um, one of the things I'd really like to see is people within or, or businesses within Colchester, if they are going to stop, their, give up their business, uh, coming and talking to the borough about it first and saying um, we're going to be um, selling our building or what have you. It's no longer going to be used because that way we, we could potentially have first dibs on it. I'd like to have first dibs on it. I'm quite happy to, you know, we, we'd be looking at fair value. We have to, um, but that at least would give us an opportunity to either move that on to someone that we would want to be developing it or develop it ourselves. We've got the facility, we've got Amphora, um, and we've got, you know, partners in, in Essex um, that, can, that can also help us do that with the Essex County. Um, they're doing the hospital sites, you know, so actually we could work collaboratively together and do, I think, a better job than some of the people that come into our town, um, uh, as we've seen, not very far away from here, um, uh, using permitted development and creating developments which maybe uh, aren't what we would wish to see. Um, so that's an opportunity I'd like to see. Planning committees. Um, I think there is a place for them. I think it's incredibly frustrating. One of the reasons that I asked for the permitted development, you know, for us to have a member's briefing on it is so that members understood it. Personally, I can't see the point in permitted development applications going to committee. Um, that's my personal view, um, because there is nothing that can be done to change them. And why um, raise the hopes of residents or residents have their hopes raised not by members but by the very fact that it's coming to committee and they get to have their say and object to it um, if actually we're not going to be able to do something about it so personally i don't think those those applications which we cannot change because of legislation should come um, i do think i mean planning i know it's quasi judicial but it's also that there are some subjective things in planning and i think there is a place for the planning committee i think I mean, I was on it. I think the chairman was on it with me. Um, I spent seven or eight years on the planning committee before I moved to local plan. And I loved it. And I loved the fact that we could make changes and, and tweak applications to make them right or actually turn them down for perfectly valid reasons. We, we've all got the list of valid reasons to turn down and it can be subjective and planning officers may have one view. And actually having listened to people come in and have their say on the evening you can start to understand where they're coming from and you look at the valid reasons and you think about it. We've probably done a site visit and we may have a different view. And sometimes those go to appeal and sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. But I, 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 I think there's real value in having a planning committee and in that 
sort of process and I think it's important that as I've always said communities are involved and people are involved in planning and if if we if they lose that I think we'll lose quite a lot actually um I think it's important was there anything else sorry have I missed anything on there that you were I think that was all I think that was all asking thank you uh Lorcan you're next please thank you chair and uh thank you uh, council members um <coughs> um a couple of questions. One is around the point that you made about um, the increase in planning applications, um, increasing workload for the planning team. Yep. Um, and I'm just wondering what, if anything, we're doing to um, um, to deal with that and protect our staff um, and um, and their well-being. I say this as someone who uh, is uh, on strike or actually back to work <laughs> tomorrow, in part over workload. Um, <laughs> Excessive workloads, which are a serious issue and um, and can have a, a serious effect on on um, mental health and staff well-being. Uh, so that's my first question. My second question is a question that I asked to the portfolio holder for resources, uh, and I was re redirected to ask it to you <laughs> when you can, because okay. it's within your remit. And it's to do with um, the government introduced some changes um, in April last year to. Um, to the rules on how receipts from right to buy could be used. Um, and they inc that included allowing 40% of receipts to be spent on supplying new shared ownership and first homes properties, rather than just being um, ring fenced or reserved for, for houses at affordable or social rents, um, and extending the one-to-one -one replacement um, to include those types of homes as well, first homes and um, uh, sh new shared, home, shared ownership uh, homes. And, um, it was, they made it clear that these were, this was an option. Councillors didn't have to do this. Um, so my question is, what is your view on that? Um, and would you be prepared to rule out um, taking up that option? Um, I'll give you my personal view, which is that, you know, I think we all realise we have a housing crisis in this country. And it's, it's a crisis, I think, of um, affordability primarily rather than supply per se. Um, and those are the most affordable types of, um, types of homes we can have. Um, and you only have to look at the, you know, the numbers on our, on our um, housing needs register um, and, you know, the many, many more we can assume would be, happily be on that register if it wasn't completely pointless to, to sign up. Um, so, yeah, those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think it's completely pointless to sign up to our housing needs register. I know some homes, um, it could take you three years to get a home. Um, and I know you're banded. So I think if you if you find yourself in band D or band D, then I, I think you've probably got an issue. Although we have homed someone from band D this year, but for a specific reason, I probably won't discuss tonight. Um, uh, increasing workload for the planning team. Um, it's a real issue. It's a really competitive market out there as well. Um, when our neighbours are offering golden hellos to um, planners and to building control people, um, quite substantial ones, um, retaining staff is really difficult. And actually, recruiting staff is really difficult. It's not a huge pool to recruit from. Um, we have been trying to do so. We are, um, I, I think it's fair to say, struggling somewhat. That's one of the reasons that they've had a a reorganization within the team and I think they've they've made it a lot more robust by doing that um, I think uh, Mandy Jones would call it building in resilience and and she's right that's what that's what they've done um, we are we're trying to we're trying to recruit um, someone you can't replace Alistair but we need to replace uh, the position um, you know the, uh, uh, as someone within planning um, and another, you know, we're, we're looking for, for, for a couple. But one of the things that we're also doing is um, the apprentice scheme, um, which was spoken about earlier, wasn't it? Again, um, we took on an apprentice last year um, and he's been so good. He, he wasn't a young person, actually. It was, it was an older person um, who came in as our apprentice and has been so good that actually he's now becoming a planning officer. Um, being promoted to a planning officer, which is fantastic, which means we're now taking on, we're going to be taking on another apprentice. Um, and, and if that works, then actually that's going to solve part of our problem with, with enforcement, for instance. You know, the, the enforcement guys have got to go out two, a, two at a time. You know, you, you need to go out. If you're going to go on a site visit, you don't go on your own, really. Um, 
And when we only had two enforcement people, that meant there was no one in enforcement. So if you've got an apprentice, they can be doing the paperwork, answering the phones, doing that sort of stuff, because you know, our enforcement team have got 177 live cases, I think, at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's one of the reasons that I got another enforcement officer in, so that we've got three enforcement officers. Andy Knowles we've got on as, as you know, he came in part-time. Um, you'll know him well, Mike. Um, excellent, excellent enforcement officer. Enforcement's probably the bedrock of any development management team, I think. Um, if you don't have strong enforcement, then you, you know, you might as well give up with your conditions and what have you, because people will ride roughshod over you. But he has. Um, so again, we've we've kept him, we've kept him, and we're funding him for another year. So we we do have our, our three enforcement officers. To answer, sorry, that's digressing somewhat, but it's to say that we are actively trying to grow our planning team, um, and we are, yeah. They are coping with the work that they've got, but yeah, we, we do need more people. Um, so they're working hard on that. Um, right to buy receipts. Um, the answer is we haven't invested any in that way. Um, and I, I'm quite happy to say I wouldn't either. Um, I don't think it's the I don't think it's the right way to do it. Um, I am actively looking at um, Arms houses for um, being recipients of right to buy receipts. Um, they are offering homes at social rent or less. Um, it, they're, they're let on a well, let it's a license, but uh, on people's ability to pay, um, depending on their um, charitable um, aims. But at the end of the day, one of the things I've been persuaded over the last year, because I was quite keen to actually, at one point, to have Colchester to Borough Home set up as an arms house charity. I looked at whether we could do it, I looked at whether CPH could do it. Um, and I've been persuaded that we don't actually need to own the properties, um, but I am keen on increasing the amount of social housing in Colchester. And the way to do that is to spread the resources, I guess, um, and, and let some of them, you know, use some of our right to buy receipts so that we're still building affordable housing in Colchester. It's just not owned by us, but it does, it does remain homes in Colchester forever um, because of the way they work. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to do that. I'm not keen to use it in any other way, if I'm honest. And we obviously use it ourselves in our investment. We've been using it in the 100 homes and continue to do so. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And and you're yeah, right to pull me up on the. Uh, it's not. I wouldn't want to to dis discourage anyone from signing up to the housing needs register. Um, you know, I'd say it's it's completely pointless. Um, what I mean to say is, you know, I think there are lots of people who would be very very low priority, but would still be interested in the council house. Um, and so, you know, increasing social housing, I think, is a is a good thing beyond those people who are most in need as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask three questions, and I've got Nigel on the list, and I see Dennis indicating. Um, thank you, Andrew. And um, you said ask about master planning. Um, I think we've all had a go at it, but I wanted to, to just ask, as I think we often do, what's happening with sites such as Vineyard Gate um, or Britannia uh, and any other sites that were previously on the list? Okay. Set, um, I'll just list all three. Um, secondly, you, you said again about the 100 homes and only letting 16 or 17, it would be interesting to hear. It's a, a project we all absolutely support, so we all want to, to encourage you to keep plowing on with it, and if we can help in any way uh, to understand why we haven't let, it, let them all out yet. And then thirdly, you talk about a design code. I absolutely welcome that and your comments behind it. I do absolutely agree with you. I also would be interested, uh, and I like the community involvement aspect, but would be interested in an in environmental standard as well, because I know we're struggling with building regs, permitted rights, doing what they want, but is there a way we can be stronger and tougher with our environmental standards? So uh, a design code, a Colchester code, not only was about good architecture, but about innovative environmental um, standards as well. So those are my three questions. Okay, um, thank you um, very much, Chairman. Um, the answer within within master planning is um, and things that are being kept or not kept is is everything's in the mix, isn't it? Really, um, 
Vineyard Street um, is, is on hold because of its location, just as Britannia is on hold. Um, we haven't progressed with Vineyard Street, not, not because it's not potentially an award-winning scheme, actually, um, when, when you look at it and when you listen to what has been said about it by some experts, people rather more expert than me. Um, but it's just the location. It's just if you're going to master plan that area and take a holistic approach, and actually you've got the county council investing very large sums of money, some of it with S106, some of it there's uh, in St. Botolph's and that area, St. Botolph's roundabout the transport system around there. You know, I think my leader's already talked about our, our desire to see a bus station and a, and a, and a proper interchange um, in Colchester. I think the perfect location is in that area. It's right next to Colchester Town Railway Station. It makes abundant sense to have your public transport hub in that location. Um, that's, that's why I think things are on hold at the moment whilst that work is ongoing, because there's no point in filling a gap in the townscape, albeit brilliantly, if it means that you can't then do something else. So you just need to make sure that that will work. Um, Britannia, um, actually, the um, I don't know who did the brief, but the, um, the plan that came back isn't a good one. Um, I think there were plans potentially for a, a large steel and glass structure on there at one point. Um, whether, whether that was ever going to happen, I don't know. But there were also, there are bits of it that you just can't build on because of where they are and what's underneath them historic stuff that's underneath them and the master plan or the, the plan for St Botolph's had put buildings on top of that so that's why that hasn't been progressed but it, it will be in part it, you know it's in the master planning area chairman so that will be that will be taken forward um, but the whole thing needs to be planned holistically I think um, what else did you ask about design codes um, Yes, I think um, th there would be room for, I think I have to talk to Simon Cairns and co to talk about environmental standards. I think that would be an interesting, um, an interesting thing to look at within those. Um, I'm, I'm just fed up with seeing hom homogenous buildings going up. Um, you know, where, where you live in Wivenhoe, it's got quite distinct designs um, and you're about to get dare I say, some ticky-tacky, very similar stuff going up, uh, in, again, by a volume house builder. And, and, you know, I've tried to defend some of the things going on there on your behalf recently. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to look at that. And, and I'm wondering what else you asked me, because I thought there were three. There's 100 homes um, struggling to let out, just to explain. It, it's, not, it's not that there, there's no struggle to let them out. The, the issue with 100 homes has been... Um, has been the voids and has, has just been sorting out. You've got to remember there was, and, and we've inherited this, and it's, uh, you know, who, who, I'm, I'm not going to portion any sort of blame, that because of where it, where it happened, but you've got the same contractors who are sorting out our normal voids are also the people who are sorting out the voids in the 100 homes. They can only do so much. So... In a way, I mean, you're looking at KPIs later and you're looking at the fact that things slip for voids. You know, it's it's difficult to, to do it in that time period. And if you went out, as I'm sure many of you have, and you looked at some of the void properties, which I've done, you can understand why. It, I mean, you can't believe they can turn it around in 28 days, let alone 25 days. I mean, it, it, it's phenomenal the amount of work that has to be done. And it's all different contractors who are coming in, isn't it? It's different different teams of people who are coming in to do different jobs um, to do that. So, yeah, that, that's why that's happened. We have, I think, eight of them we've just done a separate contract for, for a different contractor, so that we can, we can get a different, eight, you know, eight of them away using someone else. Again, it, it's just to speed up the process. But... It's, it's been difficult and it's because of materials and it's because of the labour force and that's why I said I inherited this at the, you know, at where we were in, at the stage we were in the pandemic and we are struggling. But it's not just us, it's every local authority, it's every developer and what have you. I, I know people who are trying to get extensions built who, 
who are looking at two years down the road to get a builder to do something. You just, you can't do it. We've had the same issue with, you know, Elfrida House. You can't, we can't get the blocks to, you know, it's designed with one sort of block. We've had to use a different sort of block. That means you've had to have some design changes. Fortunately, it hasn't had a, 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 a big cost impact, but these things could have if you can't source the materials that you want. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'll move on. I have Nigel and then Dennis. So, Nigel, please. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, I, 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 I don't know if you can answer this really. This is just a, a business about design code, design guide. Um, I don't quite see how on earth we can, how that's, how that's actually going to work. Um, are we, do we have to pre present, does somebody you go out to contract to get somebody to come and do that? Or how on earth can you begin to con consider doing that? I just wonder if you can perhaps just briefly answer that. Or, or if, if it's a bit in the future, perhaps leave, leave me to worry about that when it happens. I just don't quite see how you can, how so in somewhere like Colchester, where everybody thinks they know what should go into Colchester. Um, how on earth you start from scratch and build a design guide. My, my main question really was around neighbourhood plans, which I know you're very keen to, uh, to develop. Um, I wonder how that idea was going. Uh, I'm a great advocate of neighbourhood plans. Um, we did one in my village and, and it's, it's, it's very, very good. And I've seen them work very well in other villages. Um, so I just, and I know you're very keen to do them, not just in villages, but in, in na proper neighbourhoods, really, in the urban areas and that sort of thing. So it's... How are you progressing with that, Andrew? Um, as far as master plan, or not master planning, as design code, um, that will be work that has to go out. We will have to get someone in to help us with um, doing design codes. Um, we're looking at, um, I'm, I'm going to consult notes here because I know I'm looking at at least five areas. I'm looking at town centre with character areas. I'm looking at former market towns and large villages uh, like Dedham and Wivenhoe, Village Streets, Waits Cone Chapel, Dispersed Villages, Former Ties, Plateau, Clayland and Heathland Communities, Tiptree, Open Countryside Sites and their landscape character. It's a very big piece of work, I have to admit that. Um, and we are going to need some help doing it and we are putting some you know, budget to, towards doing that. We have to. Um, but you can also involve people and communities and the likes of the Civic Society. I mean, they're desperate to get involved in Colchester and and how we shape the town and plan and and what it looks like and what the buildings look like and there's some tremendous expertise in there as well for goodness sake we've got you know the the emeritus architect for um, Canterbury and I think Westminster is the chairman we've you know at the end of it, John Burton so actually and, and and we've got some brilliant officers of our own who are good at this stuff so we will be it's a big piece of work, Nigel, but it will happen, and it is perfectly feasible to happen, but we are going to need some help doing it. We just haven't got the resources to do it ourselves in-house on our own. But I think it's an opportunity to, to work collaboratively with stakeholders and people within our town to help us do that. And I think we need to you know, put our hands up and say, we'd like you to help us. And I'm sure they will. I've spoken to them, so I know they will. Um, Neighbourhood plans, yeah, really keen on neighbourhood plans. Um, we've got some progressing. We've got two of them actually going to referendum on my birthday, um, which is March Day and uh, West Mersey. Uh, we've got more in the offing. We've got, I think, West Burgholt talking about reviewing theirs. We've got the Tiptree one hopefully coming up soon. We've had issues with Tiptree, as you know, or with the Tiptree plan, uh, but that's coming up soon. But, yes, we are... Um, we are progressing with neighbourhood plans and encouraging people to, to, to do neighbourhood planning. I, I, I've been slightly frustrated, if I'm honest. One of the letters I've written to the Secretary of State has been over um, neighbourhood planning and the fact that inspectors seem to think that you can still, even though someone has planned positively for growth, you can still pop an extra few houses in here and there. Dennis is, is your... The person sitting next to you is one of the people that suffered from that in, in, in his ward. Um, but, you know, we've written, we've complained about it. We've said if people plan positively for growth, which is what neighbourhood plans do, then we should do everything to protect that. And we will do so. And we're doing that in, um, in With and Ho, as you know. I've been very keen to do that, working with you and with colleagues, Chairman. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Dennis, next, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. 
Uh, my first question is a sort of a, a very wise strategic question. Um, I get asked quite often, why is it that Colchester, which has the fastest growing town uh, in East Anglia, building more houses uh, than anyone else, uh, for which a share of those are um, uh, affordable, social, yet we have a whopping great uh, waiting list of some sort of 3,000 uh, or so families who would like a house. And it, it sort of seems a uh, bit of a dichotomy to many people that so many houses are being built, uh, yet we are not managing to uh, via the, uh, the proportion for social uh, and affordable, we're not managing to get people from the housing list uh, into these houses, so reducing the list. So that's my first question. Um, uh, w what is your take on that? Uh, second question, Chairman. Um, uh, great that we're going to produce our own code to replace the, the Essex um, code, or Essex guidelines. Uh, great that we're going to put in lots of um, environmental issues uh, to be addressed in it. But every time we do that, we put up uh, significantly the cost of actually building and delivering uh, a new house. And if you look at the statistics over the last 10 years, the price of houses have rocketed up beyond the means of people to, um, to buy them uh, because we're adding so many new features, extra environmental protection and so on, um, lagging and, uh, uh, and, and, and other uh, gizmos, uh, which is putting houses out of the reach uh, of many people. And I wonder what your view is on that and whether uh, this will be addressed um, in the code. My third question um, is on the local allocation to tenants. Uh, as you'll know, four of the, um, the houses which uh, Amphora have built were in, uh, in, were, um, in uh, Oldham, in, in my division. And there was great disappointment in the local community that absolutely no one on the, uh, the list um, was allocated one of those houses. And I, I wonder just what we are doing to ensure that where possible, we are ensuring that local tenants on the list get uh, a priority in regard to houses which are built uh, in their area. And my final question, sorry if they're sort of random because it was as I wrote them down, uh, is on the master planning. Uh, I was just a bit perplexed uh, to hear you mentioning uh, buildings of steel and glass uh, appearing in the, uh, the master plan. Colchester, surely, Chairman, is a historic town. We already have several carbuncles uh, on the landscape. And the last thing I want here suggested is that we have London-type skyscrapers um, of steel and glass going up. And can we have an assurance that the master plan under your control will never contain um, proposals to build such appalling architecture in a historic town? Thank you, Chairman. Okay. I don't know if I've written all of those down. Um, where did we start, Dennis? Um, uh, okay, we started on, because um, I've written down 3,016, which is, I think is where we are um, with our housing needs register at the moment. I might, be, I might be wrong. I think band A to C, I'm on something like 1,667 people. Um, Frustratingly, and I always think of Band A to C as I was saying to Lorcan earlier, because they're the most in need uh, and probably the most likely, if I'm honest, to get um, to get housed. Um, yes, we are um, growing quickly. We always have um, grown, uh, but people move here. People are born here. Um, the Lorcan hit the nail on the head. I think I don't think it's a supply issue. I think it is an affordability issue with housing. I've said that on the local plan for years. Um, and people go on the housing needs register, and we try to we try to um, provide homes for them or help provide homes for them. 
Um, I think one of the first things that's been negotiated away, unfortunately, in the past has been the affordable housing in, you know, when you look at S106 agreements, etc. Not through, again, necessarily fault of the planners, it just, it, it, it's happened, it's a cake. And it seems to be one of the first things that goes. I think we've been really strong in culture. So this time round with the plan and we've got 30% um, affordable housing requirement. Um, I think we can be robust on that. I think the government wants us to be robust on it, actually. Um, I think they've taken away a lot of the viability arguments that developers might use to say, well, we can't possibly afford to put in all the affordable housing because it's not viable. Um, that, that doesn't work as far as government concerned now. So, and, and I think anyone, any developer getting involved in buying into you know, land in Colchester now knows full well what the, what the policy burden is going to be, which is 30% affordable housing, is, is why I think it was so important that we did the SPD for the ABRO site. Um, we made it very, very clear what we would expect to see on that particular site. Um, and even bid for it ourselves um, on the basis that we knew what we could afford to pay for it because we knew what we had to deliver on it. So um, let, let's see what happens with that one. But yeah, um, it, it's a frustration. I, I, I get it, Dennis. I hope it is going to get better. I can't guarantee it will because I do think we have this affordability issue and I think that we are going to see people, you know, the housing needs register will will grow and decrease. We did a big review on it. We did used to have over 6,000. You and I discussed this some time ago. It's now down to 3,000 because there was a review and an awful lot of people came off it when we realised that they were, they were no longer on there, so to speak. Um, I have looked at changing it. I looked at the, the tendering model where, you know, tendering, you've got to live in tendering for three years before you can get onto the housing needs register, which I did think about. Um, not necessarily getting quite that extreme. If you move out of tendering for even a short while and you move back, you're going to be born there. You move back in there. You still have to be there for three years before you can go on the housing need register. I looked at our gateway to home choice and thought, do we want to, I asked officers to do some work on that. And I found that actually we're net exporters rather than importers of people. So it, it's worth our while staying with gateway to home choice. Um, cost of... Um, Cost of the additional, you're talking about design codes aren't going to, I hope they're not going to add cost, Dennis. I think once people know what the Colchester code is, I think developers will, will create homes which will meet our code, so to speak. But I, I hope they're not going to be the same as the homes that I go and see in Siren Sister or you know, Edinburgh or York or what have you. Um, as far as the... Um, all of the additional things that are going in. Yes, I know that a lot of the environmental stuff adds to the cost, but it also saves money to the person that goes into the home. So whilst the additional outlay might be larger for a home, the, the whole reason for trying to meet a net zero or, or to produce a carbon neutral home is that you won't have to be spending the money that, I mean, my utility bills are crippling um, at the moment. Um, the idea is to try and safeguard against that, I think. So whilst it might be more expensive to, to purchase it, it's going to be cheaper to run it, in my view. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so um, local allocation. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if, if you didn't get local people into your homes. One of the things I'm doing or have done um, is a pilot scheme. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, in Laird de la Haye, we've got a development, um, I think it's, it'll end up at about 70 houses, um, which will have 30% affordable. Um, part of it's a rural exception site, part of it is, um, is a straight market housing site. And we are putting in, we're actually writing into the S106, a, um, a clause that the homes will be affordable homes for local people. So um, it's a local lettings policy on first let, um, the, it, it, the Royal Exception site will be in perpetuity. The, uh, the other ones will be on first let, but it actually means that we can take in, uh, I worked it out, I think I can, I can hopefully, on bands A to C, I can house around 20, 21 families all living within a stone's throw of Laird de la Haye that probably wouldn't otherwise, but they're all band A to C. 
um, but wouldn't otherwise necessarily get a home locally. I'm, I'm calling it communities that grow together, stay together. Um, I thought that was quite catchy. Tina Hinson, I don't know, was so keen on it, but I just thought it worked quite nicely because I think you need to, whilst a lot of us are NIMBYs, I mean, if we all put our hands up, some of us, we really would rather not see development on our doorstep. Actually, you've got to show that there are some real positives from development. And one of the positives, I think, is the fact that you can keep communities together, help them stay together, and affordable housing does that within those communities. So that's one of the reasons that I've done that. We'll have to see what the outcomes of that are. Um, there might be some unintended consequences. That's why we've done it as a pilot. When I talked to planning officers, they've looked at it and they said, everyone's going to want to do this. And I think they, they would. And I think, especially for rural communities who don't see a lot of growth, or haven't seen a lot of growth, when those opportunities arise, I think that's a really important thing to try and do. Um, and your last point was about um, uh, steel and glass structures. I actually do want to have a conversation about heights in Colchester. I think at some point, I think we've become very wedded to, it mustn't go above three stories um, or four stories. And I think we do need to talk about maybe heights and gentle densities and what have you within Colchester. but in the right places. Um, I think the one you're referring to, there was a there, there was an idea of putting a Colchester shard in, which was a 11 story, yeah, steel and glass structure. That, that, no, that certainly won't happen. Um, that's not gonna happen in our master plan, I don't believe, um, if we're in control. No. Is the answer to that one. Um, I think that was all your questions, Dennis. I think that is everybody's questions then at this point. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, in-depth answers and your honesty there. It's always uh, good to hear from you. So thank you. Definitely um, want to continue that pilot into other areas. We've been talking about it definitely within our um, aspect in we Wivenhoe have. with our neighbourhood plan and adding to that really. Uh, but thank you. Okay, there are no other questions. So you are relieved. Go home, rest up, take some more Lemsip. Thank you for attending. We've reviewed your portfolio. We've yeah. asked you questions, so there's no specific actions that come from that. Oh, bless you. Thank you. I will go home and start preparing for tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Are we all looking forward to that? Enjoy the rest of your evening. And you've got, you've got two people who I have a lot of dealings with coming up, both of whom, again, are brilliant. Thank you. And incredibly helpful. Thank you. Yes, Karen and Jeff are still on the line. Thank you for that. Right, good night, Andrew. Thank you. We'll move on to item 12, the corporate key performance indicator targets for 2020-23. And we have our own... Uh, supporting officer Richard Block uh, to present this item, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, panel members. I'll be brief, um, taking into account the time. Um, uh, obviously, this is a report you'll be familiar with. It's around setting our corporate key performance indicators for the next financial and municipal year. Um, you're seeing this report and considering the proposed indicators prior to Cabinet um, in March. So whatever input and recommendations you make can be considered by cabinet when they set those indicators um, for the next financial year. The only thing I really wanted to say, um, many of the KPIs um, remain the same, um, at the same level. Some are proposed to change. Um, some are actually being restored to pre-COVID levels after being relaxed slightly. Um, one or two are being um, reduced in light of um, some of the issues that we heard Councillor Ellis talk about, particularly the voids, turnaround KPI. And recognising some of the pressures within the um, construction industry. And there's one um, completely new KPI indicator, and that's really as a result of the feedback from this panel um, around the previous indicator for homelessness and how um, Culture to Borough Homes are managing that on the Borough Council's behalf. A new indicator is proposed, which is really around temporary accommodation, temporary accommodation and the number of households that actually reside in, in that type of accommodation, which is far from ideal, and is as a result of us not being able to obviously um, manage a particular homelessness issue, 
Um, we felt that that's a really good indicator. The last indicator was quite difficult, I think, for you to understand. This is probably a bit, bit simpler for us both to explain track performance and also compared to other local authorities. This is a nationally collected indicator, so we'll be able to do benchmarking. Um, we'll present that both as an overall number of households, so you'll be able to track whether that number goes up and down, as well as a ratio of the number per thousand households over, overall within the borough. So again, we can benchmark across with, with other councils and I'd leave it there and take any questions. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you, Richard. That last point in particular is, is much better. Um, and we do like to benchmark as well and to understand how to uh, rate ourselves against other councils. There's two points I wanted to bring up and um, we may have Jeff and Karen ready for the next item and, and one of them would relate to their performance indicators. So I will bring it up with them as well. Um, and that is the, the re-letting of council homes. And I fully understand it and, and why with the explanation tonight and understanding what some of the houses are like and the, the issues they are left with. I just wondered whether there was a way of breaking down that target even further. So if you find a home that is in an absolute state and you could rate that as a four or five, and then you pick up a house that actually doesn't need as much work, could, could there be a sliding scale that enables us to, to more fairly observe this target rather than if, if there's too many that are, are longer term relets, we need to understand that and we need to understand why. And does the average get pulled down by a number of longer term issues compared to some that are actually getting through quite quickly? I just wanted to understand that because we definitely had better rates two or three years ago, four years ago, which I was quite proud of. Um, and then it has declined. Um, it's certainly a point you may want to raise with, um, with Jeff and Karen. It's, of course, as a panel, if there's an area that for the new municipal year, you'd like to really kind of look at in a bit more detail on any of the KPIs, you could, of course, add that to your work program um, for um, further consideration, a bit more understanding. Um, it may be a useful piece of scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you. I'll bring it up with Jeff and Karen as well. Uh, thank you. The second point was just residual waste. I see that that's not changing the residual waste, uh, household waste collection. I do think that there are reasons why it has been more difficult to reach that target. But I also feel that the further steps we take, the steps that we see supermarkets slowly taking, uh, government taking some or, or should be taking more uh, action on reducing packaging, etc. I do think we should be challenging ourselves and looking at opportunities locally. So I do think that target needs to be acknowledged that we're perhaps not stretching ourselves enough or what, what more should we be doing to bring that down? Because that is essentially reducing waste is one of the biggest and most important parts of the waste hierarchy. Um, so um, the panel may recall that this year um, the residual waste target um, has been particularly challenging um, to achieve because of some of the, the differences in um, the way our householders are, are perhaps working now um, with a greater proportion you know, working in a hybrid style between um, working from home um, and in the office. And I think some of those changes are going to remain to an extent. Certainly we'll um, um, go back to, to greater office working, but I think there'll be a residual amount of hybrid working from home. What you will see is that we are restoring the recycling target. So as an overall proportion of the waste that's collected, we're proposing the greater amount of that will actually be recycled. So I think that just recognises the fact that, you know, there is more waste being created, but we're going to recycle more of it, which hopefully deals with the concern you've raised. Thank you. And your past expertise in the waste area is helpful, Richard. Um, I just feel I know that I often take rubbish back from my place of work because they don't have enough recycling facilities and then I recycle it at home. But almost you've got a captive audience with them working at home as well. So I fully understand what you've just said and take that as a good answer, thank you. But there's also, I think, more opportunity with them at home. Say, so, right, have you thought about recycling this, et cetera? So I do think if I accept your answer, there's still a bit more we can do with that captive audience at home. And uh, I suppose I could put that to cabinet uh, 
along with comments on these indicators. Okay, are there any other points from anyone else? I haven't seen any indications. Uh, nor can Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Uh, yeah, I'm very pleased to see the um, the change for the uh, the on the. Um, to the, to the households in temporary accommodation, the thing I was, I was going to ask about that was um, why um, only as a ratio and not as an absolute? So you've already answered that. We'll get both, and I think that's really useful because, I mean, in an, in an ideal world, and it would be an ideal world, we'd want that number down to zero you know, as an absolute number. So I think looking at the absolute number is, is useful and important. Um, my question was, was just around the, um, um, the first KPIs in the, in the table that we have in the report. Um, around time to process housing benefit claims and local ta council tax support claims. Um, and it just says um, it's recognised that room should be given to extend processing times should resources require or if, if efficiencies can be made. And I just wanted, wondered if you could expand on, on what's being referred to there. Um, absolutely. It's a um, very good question. Um, uh, again, panel members may recall um, having considered the six month performance against these KPIs. Um, performance has been exceptional, well well within the five and six days respectively, I think as, as quick as two and three days respectively. Um, so I think that almost the comment is an anticipation of a challenge. Well, why aren't we pushing the target to, to even shorter a shorter period? I think that comment, comment just reflects that. I don't think it's pr proposing that we would um, relax the, the KPI, but it's saying that actually it gives us a bit of slack within the, um, the existing performance, which is exceptionally high, um, particularly compared to, to, to um, comparable authorities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, then um, we have scrutinised it. Um, I'm, I suggested an addition of a bit of challenge over what we can do with the captive audience of people working at home to try and reduce uh, or any campaigns to reduce the um, household waste. Would councillors support that being added on as a comment to cabinet? Accepting the answer that Richard gave that uh, it can stay as it is, recycling targets go up, but definitely a campaign to support trying to reduce that waste. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chairman. The um, my take on the uh, on on this is that in in sort of previous years, it's been quite easy to see just how our performance has changed. But with the, uh, the major impact of COVID, it really is difficult to sort out the uh, the exact direction of travel or the the velocity of change. Uh, and in which direction it is. And I think it will be another year or so before we can we can really get to grips with some of these statistics in the way we have done sort of two, three, four years ago. I, I do understand that. And I think it's also the time where we do need to act. You know, whilst we've got people in these new environments, some are going back, back to work, hybrid models, probably best to try and act now. But I think you're right in terms of the balancing out of figures and statistics. I had enough nods to add that note from around the room. So just add that note about challenge um, in terms of recycling campaigns, campaigns to reduce that household waste target in order to help meet that target. OK, uh, but acknowledging the COVID changes, of course. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. We will move on. Um, we have all scrutinised and acknowledged that report. Item 13. Colchester Borough Council Homes Performance Targets 2022 to 2023. And Jeff and Karen is upside down, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure how you can help with that, Karen, but uh, we'll go to Jeff and uh, Karen will be there to support if needed, upside down or not. So Jeff, over to you, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen Lehman, Director of Housing at Colchester Borough Homes, who's joined me tonight. Um, following the, the panel's annual review of Colchester Borough Homes performance by scrutiny panel in August 2019, the panel requested that it receive a further report setting out the proposed targets for CBH performance for 2021 and beyond. Uh, panel were asked to note the performance targets given as Appendix A and make any recommendations for 2022, 23 and beyond. Um, the CBH targets are set out for five years in the medium-term delivery plan, 
and 2022-23 is the first year of a new plan. And all targets have been reviewed this year to ensure they are still relevant, reflect government thinking and show assurance to CBC of its almost performance. Uh, most of the targets can be ben benchmarked nationally or sub-regionally. Um, the government's agenda is changing and this can be seen in the social housing white paper proposals and sub subsequent legislation and, and regulation. And going forward, there'll be more emphasis on building safety, fire safety, compliance and satisfaction levels from our tenants. The, these have all been considered in the new uh, targets, taking into account government guidance and regulation as it's, as it's given along with the council's strategic goals and objectives. Uh, the regulator of social housing is currently cons consulting on a, new, on a set of new KPI measures around repairs, safety, complaints, and tenant satisfaction levels with data collection for these due to commence in April, 2023. Um, there's been some changes to the indicators this year. Firstly, as Richard mentioned, the homeless indicator has caused some issues previously. I think in previous years it was a little bit too complicated um, and last year we changed it um, to try and make it a bit easier and simpler um, but I think we've gone a bit too far in the other direction and although the numbers were easier to understand um, it needed quite a bit of background information for it to make um, more sense and easier to comprehend. Um, we've, we've therefore, as, as Richard mentioned, um, agreed a different indicator with a target that can be easily benchmarked with other authorities and the target measures the number of households in temporary accommodation per thousand of the population. One of the key priorities for the service is to reduce this number and the time spent in temporary accommodation. As the number increases in, and decreases, it will show demand on the service and the solutions available to prevent homelessness. Um, secondly, the target for gas servicing has been removed um, to ensure that councils meet, meet all of its obligations in regards to compliance, including new ones arising from the social housing white paper. A new suite of indicators is to be provided to the council on all aspects of compliance. So things like gas, electric, legionella, asbestos, lifts. Um, the council, the portfolio holder, cabinet need to be assured that compliance is being delivered and, brief, and briefed on any concerns and risks. And scrutiny panel will have the opportunity to review this as part of the CBH annual review during the year. And lastly, there's a new target on sustainable homes. The new asset management strategy sets a target of 100% of our stock to have a band C energy performance certificate rating by 2030. The new target in the KPI will ensure that this is being delivered. And it should be noted that delivery is planned on dealing with the worst performing assets first, and this is reflected in the profile of the target. Panel asked to note that the three, that three of the CBH targets also appear in the council suite of KPI indicators, as Richard has already said. And CBH annual review of performance for 21-22 by scrutiny panel is due in the summer. All the targets are detailed in Appendix A of my report. And between Karen and myself, we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that's pretty comprehensive. And I think it's really useful that you've uh, indicated where the changes uh, have occurred and you've, you've explained those. For me, those three changes uh, do make sense. We've had some discussion, I don't know if you heard, um, about 10 minutes ago, we were talking about the homeless indicator and the improvement upon that. And we do believe that is much more beneficial for us all um, and wanting to reduce that down clearly. Um, the gas servicing one, again, seems very logical and, and better at understanding uh, a wider range of those issues and being able to pinpoint uh, particular fire safety or electrical safety issues. Um, and the last one as well, I, I think that is uh, an ambitious target. I hope that by the end of the 26 year, uh, 2026, that we may have better technologies and better investment and funding to say that we can go even further. But for now, I think that's an ambitious target to, to apply uh, and to go towards. I just wanted to check if you heard, I was saying about the, um, the relet of council homes and that target going up to 28 days. I just wondered if there was a, 
a way in which you could break it down even further so that you could deal with some of the easier turnaround homes in a in a in a target that was um, ambitious and accept that there's a longer term time frame for some of the houses that are left in a terrible condition or need completely re re uh, uh, redecorating etc so i just wondered if that would help at all jeff would you like me to pick that up yes please yes oh, i'm sorry that you can't see me my camera seems to have failed altogether now i've tried to turn myself the right way up um but with regard to reletting homes um some of this is down to the maths and some is down to the benchmarking group and how they measure empty properties. So if I start with the benchmarking group, the benchmarking group defines what we measure and how we measure them. Um, and it only allows us to, ex what we count at the moment are general needs properties. So it excludes sheltered housing, um, but it also excludes what we refer to as major works voids. And up until two years ago, major works voids were kind of fairly fluid and that could contain um, perhaps fitting a new kitchen or fitting a new bathroom. Now the definition of major works void is stricter and has increased. So it needs a number of elements to be replaced. And in fact, deems the property would not have been normally habitable. Um, so it means that we remove a few. The other major change has been the actual numbers. So where we're looking at averages, clearly where we used to have probably on average 40 properties a month, looking at around 500 lets a year, that's reduced fairly dramatically. And at the end of January this year to date, we'd only let 212 properties. Um, and just looking at January as an example, um, where we only let 15 properties, means you've only got a few properties to set an average against. And in a month like January, where contractors didn't work over the Christmas period, um, we had catch up weeks from there. So it only took three properties in January to take between eight and nine weeks to let, with most of the others being let between three and five weeks to make the average just over six weeks. So if we'd have when we used to have a bigger number of voids, we could turn a few round in two weeks or one week, um, and that would offset the average. So it is, is a game of numbers, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you for that explanation, Karen. And I'm sure if you had a, a, a different way of doing it, you'd, you'd shout. Um, okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Willits, Dennis. Uh, Chairman, yeah. But... Um, before the meeting, I was quite happy with the, uh, the head of this report and uh, uh, subscribed completely to the revisions that have been made. However, Councillor Ellis raised an um, interesting point in his presentation to us, and that was the mobility of people with housing need. And looking at the, um, the, the, the target uh, for housing um, temporary accommodation for those in desperate need who uh, turn up on our doorstep, um, do we have any indication about the, uh, the percentage of those, the, the 2.9 per hundred um, per thousand households equivalent, uh, which are from Colchester or which come into Colchester um, when they become homeless because of the perhaps stricter uh, approaches that are adopted in neighbouring bor boroughs. So are, are these the 2.9 um, people from Colchester or are there any people in migrating to take advantage uh, of uh, our more beneficial system in uh, providing accommodation for those who are in desperate need? I'll pick that up again, Jeff. Um, I haven't got the numbers to hand, but I can report on the numbers. Um, to be homeless in Colchester, you do have to go through a process of, we determine um, a local connection. Um, and although the local connection in relation to homelessness, it you know, can be living in the borough for six of the last 12 months or have a family connection in Colchester. And we do also... Now, again, Homelessness Reduction Act has widened the criteria of people that we accept as homeless. So the criteria for what people were defined as having a priority need 
or their reason for being homelessness has been very much extended. And we knew when that legislation changed that it would increase the numbers that came to us for support and who came to live in temporary accommodation. Um, and bear in mind, we see people who may be suffering um, domestic abuse or fleeing violence from elsewhere. Uh, we do have numbers of people who come from outside the borough, but the, the numbers are actually probably few. Um, I, I will get the figures and, and provide you with them just out of interest, but it's something that we do track as we go through, but probably less than you expect there to be. Thank you. So if those could be provided um, by email, via email after the meeting, that would be helpful. Thank you. Are there any other comments or recommendations at all? Councillor Whitehead, is that a finger? Morgan? That is a finger. Um, yes, I just, a um, couple of things. Um, uh, yes, on the, on the temporary accommodation, the change on that metric, so that's very welcome. Um, and uh, we learned from this report that um, one of the reasons for that is that the, um, uh, the change in the KPI allows for, for benchmarking, uh, but in the table, we don't get informa in any, any information about how we do compare. So um, I wonder if we have information about how we compare on that particular measure, um, or if we could have that in future reports. Um, and um, likewise, with the final, uh, the final um, one in that table, um, EPC rating for uh, properties band C or above, um, again, it would, be, it would be good to know how we compare, maybe on that measure as well, um, either now or, or for future meetings. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Whitehead. We did discuss in the spokesperson's briefing about benchmarking and benchmarking going forward for some of those indicators. But Jeff, can you help, please? Yeah, I, I will just pick that up. Um, actually, um, it was it was a question that Councillor Willits raised actually at uh, the the last uh, Coxton Borough Homes um, scrutiny last year about about benchmarking and benchmarking data. Um, I haven't included it in the targets, but it's something that is applicable to all, all of all of these targets and something that will be included when it comes back to scrutiny panel uh, in the summer um, and you look at CBH's performance. Um, it, you know, the, the, all, all, of, all of those targets are, are benchmarkable. Thank you. So today we're looking at the targets to set them going forward. Jeff saying that definitely that benchmarking data will come when we judge the performance going forward in the summer. Okay, so thank you for that, Jeff. That will be handy. And thanks for the input from Councillor Winnets previously. Okay, um, if there's no further comments, then I, and there's no recommendations, I ask that we note the draft performance uh, targets and that we make no specific recommendations going forward. Okay, we agreed on that. Agreed. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Karen, for your work. Thank you for staying on the line so long. Thank you. Um, so we finally come to item 14, the work program. On the work program, we do need to just have a look at the last meeting. We have the one Colchester partnership and safer Colchester partnership coming to the panel. And we just want to make sure members that we give them a clear steer, like we gave the arts organizations a clear steer and a tight uh, remit from which to present. I want to do the same with one Colchester. Um, just a couple of points for me, we are looking at safety um, aspects, but also one Colchester in terms of preventative stuff, health and well-being aspects as well. And one thing that uh, the one Colchester partnership and the partners within it have been working on is the NICS contract about community services. Uh, so I wondered whether we can ask about that and the health approach within one Colchester. Um, and, but I, I'll help focus that remit down with the spokespersons. And also, um, I was thinking lessons learned from COVID. I was part of the one Colchester partnership as leader during COVID. And we did work together very well, pull together very well. I, I don't want them to come here and explain everything that was done it you trust me it was fantastic and life-saving and life uh, improving for our our residents but i just wonder about the 
lessons learned, how to work closer together, further partnership on the back of that, um, more integrated working. I just think that's a challenge that would be good to see how far they've got, because I know with my other hat on on the CCG board, the Alliance working is going very well. And just to understand what they are doing and how they could extend that further, that benefits us all um, in a well-being sense and in a financial sense. Um, other comments, Dennis? Uh, chairman, uh, do, do you want to uh, vacate the chair on that occasion and perhaps be scrutinized yourself uh, if you're claiming expertise on the subject? Uh, I mean, I can happily declare an interest and, and step aside. Um, I, I, was in, I was involved in it. I do have a part to play within the, the health authority, which is known as the CCG and the alliance that has pushed forward. So when it comes to it, Dennis, I'll absolutely make sure I'm whiter than white. And if I should sit at the other end of the table, I will. I'll discuss that with spokespersons unless it was a cheeky comment but i'm happy either way whatever whatever works whatever richard and the monitoring officer thinks best oh it's all in, always embarrassing chairman when the, uh, the the chairman sort of asks himself questions and then has to answer the question and is uh, the chairman decides that his own reply was not satisfactory and more is required you know i'm always fair dennis always fair so we'll see what happens um i know councillor bentley used to have a similar situation with uh, the highways uh, and uh, his role at county. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what works with that. Are there any other comments or suggestions in terms of what to focus on? No, I'll ask um, the spokespersons to bring forward any ideas from the different parties then. Okay, thank you. Just before 10 o'clock, we did pack in a lot. So thank you for that. It's been a, a very informative meeting. The next uh, agenda has a bit less on it. Okay, thank you all. Go get warm. Good night. See you tomorrow. And for those on the environment panel, see you on Thursday.